Hello Abnormal Family. I have another encounter for you. This one will be a little longer than what I'm normally used to uh, putting out. So I hope you enjoy this one and um, let's get started. December 30th, 2021, the moon, a waning crescent. It's important to note that at the time I lived in western Michigan, not too far from Lake Michigan, and in a deeply rural town. Fewer than 2,000 people reside in my hometown, and I lived some 20 minutes away from civilization. While there were a few people, there were miles of rolling farmland and untamed forest that surrounds us, giving my father ample room to indulge in his favorite hobby of hunting. I was never too interested in hunting myself. I felt it insulting to the majestic deer who lived on our property and frankly unfair whenever guns were involved. This was just one of the many differences between my father and I. Still, he did his best to involve me in his hobbies. That is how, to despite hours of protesting, I was dragged into the woods with him and up a tree after school. Wearing full camo and holding his rifle and binoculars, my father scanned the surrounding woods and fields for any sign of activity. I, on the other hand, was swaddled in a blanket and in a horribly uncomfortable lawn chair, not at all enjoying myself. While I loved the woods and still do, I just wasn't interested in the evening activities. I originally started scanning the path which we came from, wondering if I could see our home tucked past all the trees. Son, stop squirming. Everything in the woods can hear you, my father said gruffly. I huffed in annoyance but listened, opening my book and trying to get comfortable. It was later in the year and in the afternoon the sun quickly turned to dusk. I had lost track of time and only started to pay attention to my surroundings when I was going to complain to my dad that it was becoming too dark to read. Looking up I realized he was asleep. I was first filled with annoyance that I had been brought out to these cold dark woods for my father's entertainment only to have him fall asleep on me. Then a sudden mischievous curiosity overtook me. Binoculars and a rifle among other treasures were in front of me. My father's tools that I was told never to touch within arm's length and for the taking. The gun was too intimidating. The binoculars, however, were too tempting to pass up on. These were high-powered and very expensive pieces of equipment, but I snatched them up and turned to see if I could finally see the house with their help. I searched through the countless tree branches and was about to give up when I saw movement. It was low to the ground, some dark brown furred animal that was shaking violently. I couldn't make out many details and even though I saw antlers, it seemed unlike a deer. Deer were usually pretty calm and very uh, distinguishable. I couldn't begin to guess what it was looking at, though I eventually noticed it was two things. One dead and another not so much. I quickly guessed that I was looking to the distinct creatures. One a long dead deer carcass and some other animal that seemed to be dragging it through the woods. I have a habit of talking too much and this came to bite me when I muttered, What is that? under my breath. The thing stopped moving suddenly. My heart skipped a beat as I kept looking at it. There is no way this thing heard me. It was so far away. Yet I saw these long ears perk up and it turned to show its face. It was canine. A long snout that tapered into the dark nose, sharp yellowish teeth that jouted out of the awkward angles and most unnaturally illuminated in the low light and they seemed too aware to belong to an animal. Even though I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at, it deeply unsettled me. Some voice in my head, even as a child, screamed that this was not natural. Yet I was transfixed. I kept staring at it. Eventually the creature stood still, and then it turned to look up. I locked eyes, or I should say, binoculars with this thing. It cocked its head slightly and I was mesmerized by its cold gaze with an unnatural grace that hunched figure began to unfold itself. As I watched in disbelief, 
as this canine entity began to stand on two feet. It was very tall, though how tall I couldn't say, and then it looked emas emasculated, as I remember seeing rib bones through its thin haired patch on its sides. The legs were bent at an awkward angle, and given how the creature hunched and held onto the tree trunk, I guessed that while it could stand up, it was one of the un un many natural aspects of this creature. I remember it was strange, and I dare say it had hands. The paws were unnaturally shaped with spindly fingers that jouted out at the ends with long claws. The worst part of the whole event was just a sense of understanding I had a primal feeling that this creature knew I was up in the trees looking at it, that it understood completely what was going on, and that I both knew it could come get me whenever it wanted. This sense of overwhelming dread eventually led my shaking hands to drop my father's binoculars. The sharp noise shook the quiet woods as the glass from the frames broke below. That one sound seemed to set off a chain reaction. I began to violently shake and started shouting for my dad to wake up. Something's out there, dad. We need to go home, please, I begged. To his credit, he quickly woke up and took control of the situation. I explained what I saw and pointed in the general direction it was in. He reached for his binoculars and sheepishly motioned to the ground. Sorry. He scoffed and looked down the hill that happened to lead towards home. The seconds dragged by slowly until he finally looked down at me. I must have been a coyote, whatever it was, it isn't there now. Dad, it wasn't a coyote, I saw it. You spooked yourself and nothing more, he said, cutting me off. He looked around the surrounding woods and rubbed some of the sleep out of his eyes. Look, it's been long enough, it's head back, Mom must be worried sick. Dad, what if it's still out there? I demanded stepping away from the trap door that led toward the exit of the dangerous woods. Just stop. Nothing is going to hurt you. Besides, I'll keep you safe, he said, motioning to his rifle. Now, let's go home. There was no more pleading I could do, so we gave in, and we went to the ladder first as I quickly followed. I saw him shake his head when he saw the binoculars, and he picked up his run gear and began to walk home. For me, it was excruciating to walk home, and although my father tried making small talk, I was too worried. I scanned the trees and jumped at every sound. Thankfully, nothing stopped us, and we made it home safely. My father explained the events to my mother, and they both teased me for having an overactive imagination. I said nothing and just thought over the brief encounter. Over the few weeks that went by between the first encounter and my second, I began to believe that I was just seeing things. My father, he never saw evidence of anything that he sent various other hunts. And I pushed thoughts away. I eventually forgot about the incident, although its eyes always bothered me. Even after the fact, they always felt a little human, too. Some weeks later, however, I would get another encounter with this thing, and that encounter would permanently change how I saw the previous events and the world around me. It was nearing Christmas, and we were no longer in school. My father was taking us around uh, time to work to be with the family and all was well. I remember that night it was particularly bright out, and sometime after dinner our dogs began acting strangely. We had a basset hound and a lab mix at the time, and both began circling the outmost edges of the home, occasionally whining. At first we thought it was a bit odd, but still charming to see them gazing at the window, one head taller than the other. After a couple of hours of behavior went out, from the cute to concerning, my, mother, my mom and dad debated calling a vet, but eventually ruled it out that it could wait till morning and got settled in for bed. We got excited to see if there was maybe a stray animal outside and took his rifle with him. He took the dogs outside to use the bathroom. Dad wasn't afraid of much. I remember hearing some commotion, but I was honestly too engrossed in whatever video game I was playing at the time to care. Eventually, my father returned with our lab mix. Millie, but our basset Walter, was nowhere to be found. This wasn't too unusual. The dogs had plenty of space to roam out there, and he would sometimes run off for hours. Their earlier behavior seemed to be troubling my dad. Mills never left my side, he said, pointing to our lab. Walter just bolted, though. 
My mother and father tried calling for our missing dog, but no avail, and eventually started getting ready for bed. It wasn't too cold yet, and they figured he'd turn up sometime. Millie, however, became increasingly nervous. The paths she walked earlier in the day continued to patrol, though now she quickly crossed from window to window as if trying to see everything at once. She wouldn't stop, and eventually my parents put her in their room, and we parted ways for the night. My room faced the dirt drive that eventually met to the road as such as the porch was outside it. There were large windows in my room and thick drapes that managed to keep the porch light out, yet you could see if something usually bugs passed underneath the lights. So as I settled into bed, I remembered hearing strange sounds howling out in the distance that reminded me of the yelling noises coyotes would make. Still fairly standard for Michigan nights, however, Molly began making this awful whining noise. It was so loud that I could hear it from my parents' bedroom. On the other side of the house, even though she eventually went silent, I went to check up on her and my parents now worried for my dog. I don't remember what we talked about, but some time passed in my parents' room and my mother led me back to bed. I was watching the ground very nearly asleep while my mother pratted about until she suddenly stopped. Her hand gripped my shoulder tightly, and I looked up at her. What was wrong? She just staring at my window. Though the thick drapes, you could see a figure standing on our porch. It seemed to be trying to hide itself, tucked in the corner of the porch. Yet its silhouette was plain for us to see. For a moment, it just stood there until it seemed to lurch forward from a standing position to a crawl as it moved out of the window's borders. I immediately remembered that thing in the woods. I began to speak to my mother, hushed me with a finger to her, to her mouth. She dragged me back to my parents' room. Lee, something is outside of Keith's room, she said, voice clipped. She said, you have to go look. Something is out there. He said, what? Something or someone is outside Keith's room, she repeated. My father, who was originally smiling as if we were playing the prank on him, immediately sensed how serious she was. He nodded. And went for the door. Dial 911, but don't call unless something happens, he said. I'm going to check it out. Then he quickly left the room, and we just stood there. My mom finally let go of me and patted her pockets. Damn, I left my phone out in the kitchen, she said, her voice shaking. I was really young, and I didn't know what to do. I just stood there in the center of my parents' room waiting. You could hear my father slowly making his way through the house and the creak of what I assumed to be the gun cabinet opening. After what felt like ages, he finally returned slowly, opening the door. Susan, I don't see anything. He began before a booming, shaking sound filled the house. It sounded like something was trying to rip open the front door. These loud and irregular beating sounds filled the room, and my mom took me toward the floor with her. My father began to shout, I have a gun, this is private property, but the banging didn't stop. It seemed to go almost more frequent. My mom was shaking while she held me. My father looked down. Susan, call the cops and now. I left my phone in the other room, she said in a panic in her voice. My father cursed and flung the door open. Our home was now open floor plan, so I could see the front door from my parents' room. There was a large figure standing on the other side of the glass. It was massive bulk, nearly filling the entire upper window of the door. Our firewood stove was near the front door, so the light from it in our eyes of the porch light behind it helped keep the figure in the darkness. My father marched toward the door and raised his gun. My mother suddenly ran into the kitchen and got her phone. I stood there alone in the room. I heard my mother frantically call 911 while my dad approached the door and eventually fired. Even though the bashing at the front door and the shrill cries of my mother, the gunshot echoed in the house. There was a loud groaning noise from the other side of the door and then the figure quickly left. I stood frozen, just watching the whole event unfold. Susan, let's get to the basement, wait for the cops to get here, my dad yelled, keeping his eyes on the front door. I heard my mother giving our address and saw her towards me. She grabbed me in the elbow and looked past me towards the back of the bedroom in the window. I remember her screaming in my ear and dragging us toward the basement. I never got to see what it was that made her scream. As we raced down the stairs, my mother shakingly finished her conversation with the operator. There are bears outside. Please send help. They are trying to get in. I remember my mother and I huddled in the corner and my father keeping a trained eye and a pointed rifle at the basement door. The rest seems a blur. In hindsight, I don't handle stress very well. I just remember sitting there with my family quite some time 
and the police arrived. They spoke with my mother and father, and my father, wa father walked them around the house. There was a lot of damage to our front door. There were dark gouges and scratches. Pieces of the wood were missing around the frame. It almost seemed that something almost bowed the door, almost pulling it completely off the hinges. My, my father thinks that we were lucky because the heat from the wood stove had warped the frame of the door and we hadn't been able to use that door for such a long time. There was some really weird footprint outside of the door and the snow was starting to fall and I could hear my father and the police talking about how strange the footprints were and how large. One of the cops made the comment, Man, that footprint is a, is a dog but it's bigger than any human print I've ever seen. Our basset hound was later found. My dad said that it had died. They never told me how or why, just that it was dead. My dad got rid of the dog, and a few weeks later we moved from the home. I was so glad to get away from that place, and I'm pretty sure that whatever it was had killed my dog, and it came back to the house. What do you think of that one, guys? That's a pretty wild story. I think whatever seen him in the woods done what they do on so many other occasions that whenever people see these things and these things see you, they tend to follow you home or become, I don't know if it's imprinted on you or what, but there is something that causes them an attraction to follow you and sometimes they never leave. So if you're ever in the woods, be real careful of what you're looking for because you might just find it and it might just follow you home. Trust me, it happened at my granny's. That's how it all started there. It wasn't always there. It was there after they went spook hunting and they found something, well, they wasn't looking for, but it followed them home just like this. And it took a very, very long time for it to go away. I hope you all enjoyed this. Let me know what you think. Keep your head on a swivel. And I hope you enjoyed the longer story. And until next time, guys, don't be something's dinner.